Good morning, Crawford. On the count of three, we will welcome our live stream. One, two, three. Hello, live stream. Whether you are here virtually or in person, we are glad to have you join us in worship this morning. If you are on the live stream, Pisha Chen is your host. If you have joys or prayer concerns to share, please put that in the chat and Pisha will relay them to Stacy. If you are here in person and have joys or prayer requests to share, there are prayer cards in the pews. Please put your request on a card and give them to Laura Myers during the passing of the peace, and she will deliver them to me. We do have nursery care provided for children under five downstairs. Uh, Jessica is homesick this morning, so we invite older children to remain in worship. There are activity books in the narthex or here at the front if you want to make use of those. This morning we will celebrate Holy Communion and a reminder that in the United Methodist Church we practice an open table. You do not have to be a member of this church or of any church to participate. All are welcome where Jesus is host. Mark Miller, a gay black man who typically leads our music at annual conference here in New England every year, was a delegate to General Conference, representing his home conference of Greater New Jersey. At the 2012 General Conference, then also a delegate, Mark asked for a point of privilege at the plenary session to name the harm that he and other LGBTQ delegates had felt at a in a failed attempt at holy conferencing the day before when they were bullied and treated poorly. As he began to make his case, the presiding bishop ruled him out of order. Although at Mark's insistence when being told to sit down, the bishop did offer a prayer where the bishop acknowledged the failings of the previous day's conversations. You can find a video of that exchange from 2012 on YouTube. Quickly, a Stand With Mark campaign went viral, and at the closing worship in 2012, over 200 supporters of full inclusion left worship early and stood outside in silent protest that the circle was still not draw, drawn wide enough to include them or even allow them to talk about what they had experienced at that very conference. And in part, because of that history, Mark's wonderful song, Draw the Circle Wide, became a theme song of sorts at this general conference, 12 years later, where Mark and so many others found a very different reception and result. So the choir will do an abbreviated version of Draw the Circle as the introit, and then we will reprise it as our sung benediction instead of the Celtic Alleluia at the other end. Thank you. 
Good morning. Welcome to everyone. Uh, please stand as you are able. <laughs> Christ our Lord invites us to his table, all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. God. We confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. All glory to God. Amen. Our hymn is number 572, and the words are in your bulletin. Pass it on. The scripture lesson today is from Acts chapter 15, verses 1 through 21. Then certain individuals came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to discuss this question with the apostles and the elders. So they were sent on their way by the church, and as they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, they reported the conversion of the Gentiles and brought great joy to all the believers. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders and they reported all that God had done with them. 
But some believers who belonged to the sect of the Pharisees stood up and said, it is necessary for them to be circumcised in order to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and the elders met together to consider this matter. After there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, my brothers, you know that in the early days, God made a choice among you that I should be the one through whom the Gentiles would hear the message of the good news and become believers. And God, who knows the human heart, testified to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us, and in cleansing their hearts by faith, he has made no distinction between them and us. Now therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing on the neck of the disciples a yoke that neither our ancestors nor we have yet been able to bear. On the contrary, we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus just as they will. The whole assembly kept silence and listened to Barnabas and Paul as they told of all the signs and wonders that God had done through them among the Gentiles. After they finished speaking, James replied, my brothers, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first looked favorably on the Gentiles to take them from among the people for his... Simeon has related how God first looked favorably on the Gentiles to take from among them a people for his name. This agrees with the words of the prophets as it is written. After this, I will return and I will rebuild the dwelling of David, which has fallen. It's fallen from its ruins. I will rebuild it, and I will set it up so that all other peoples may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles over whom my name has been called, thus says the Lord, who has been making these things known from long ago. Therefore, I have reached the decision that we should not trouble those Gentiles who are turning to God, but we should write to them to abstain only from things polluted by idols and from fornication and from whatever has been strangled and from blood. For in every city for generations past, Moses has had those who proclaim him, for he has been read aloud every Sabbath in the Sabbath in the synagogue. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Next week, you will hear the scripture reading about that council in Jerusalem again, as we talk in more detail about the Wesleyan process of making decisions. But I used it as our text this morning to highlight the first time in the Bible that we see the leaders of the early church gather to make a group decision about a really difficult issue that was dividing them. In the case of the Council of Jerusalem, the issue was whether Gentiles had to become Jews before they could be included among the followers of Jesus. At the heart of that argument was not so much what people believed, but whether the men needed to become part of the Abrahamic covenant by being circumcised. Because God said they did in the Bible, but then seemed to be ignoring all that by pouring out the Holy Spirit on Gentiles anyway, a huge rift developed among Jesus' Jewish followers. So they gathered in Jerusalem to try to sort it out and decide the matter once and for all. That gathering is an example of what John Wesley, Methodism's founder, would have called holy or Christian conferencing. You hear the word conference thrown out a lot in Methodist circles. There are charge conferences and church conferences and annual conferences and jurisdictional conferences, and the session that has been meeting for the past two weeks is the general conference, the biggest one of all. If you substitute the word meeting for conference, you'll understand the basic function of those gatherings. But for Wesley, the act of getting together and trying to hash out differences with the Holy Spirit's guidance was so foundational to spiritual formation that Wesley made 
holy conferencing the center of his method for renewal in the Church of England, the reform movement that came to be called Methodism. Unlike in denominations where individual congregations are the basic unit, for United Methodists, the basic unit is not any one church on its own, but instead a group of churches conferencing together to discern the will of God in their particular region, known as the annual conference that meets every year. Crawford is part of the New England Annual Conference. The New England Annual Conference is part of the Northeastern Jurisdictional Conference, which then joins with conferences in nations across the globe every four years to do holy conferencing at general conference. You know, we don't yet have intergalactic conferences, but <laughs> you know, first, first Methodists on Mars may change that, I don't know. Um, but it's at that global general conference where positions on theological understanding, ethical practices, social principles, ordination, and matters of general administration and worship in all local United Methodist churches around the world are hashed out. All of those decisions are then published every four years in an updated book of discipline. That whole thing together is known as the connection. At a fundamental level, the structure acknowledges that we are part of the much larger body of Christ. That whether we like it or not, whether we agree with each other or not, we do not stand on our own. We are connected to each other. That what happens to one of us happens to all of us, and we rise or fall together. The administrative structure of the United Methodist Church is actually part of our theological underpinnings. While my colleagues in other denominations are typically ordained to word and sacrament, to preach and administer the sacraments, I and my UMC colleagues are ordained to word, sacrament, and order. Part of my ordination vows are to make sure that the administrative structures in churches I'm appointed to serve not only follow the book of discipline, but also that business is conducted in ways that foster the theological understanding of our connection through Christ to each other, to our communities, to other churches, and to the wider world. Our structure is not task-oriented, which if you attend a conference is pretty clear. <laughs> but it's designed to foster connection and community both inside and outside the church. The downside of all holy conferencing is that making decisions and enacting real change can take a very long time. In the case of working through the issues around human sexuality, it has taken us 52 years of agonizing and hurtful debate. For literally centuries, our book of discipline said nothing about same-sex relationships. Presumably Methodists before 1972 had read the Bible, but they found nothing there that they believed rose to the level of requiring church law to control or punish. That changed in 1972 when the General Conference voted to put into our social principles that homosexuality was, quote, incompatible with Christian teaching. That idea then worked its way throughout the discipline, dictating who could and could not be ordained, who could and could not be married within, with a United Methodist officiant, what causes could and could not be funded with United Methodist money or hosted in a United Methodist church or any affiliated organization, and on and on it went. From that moment, in 1972 on, Every general conference, every four years for 52 years, there have been attempts to take all that out. 
holy conferencing became hurtful conferencing. About 20 years ago, even the modest proposal to add that United Methodists were, quote, not of one mind on this issue went down in flames. I mean, nothing has been as patently obvious as the fact that we were not of one mind on this issue. We've been fighting about it every single general conference since 1972. And to me, once we couldn't even agree to state the obvious, that we did not agree about this, I believe we lost the thread. And with that lost thread, things began to unravel as everyone wanted to follow their conscience, but our consciences were leading us in different, con in different directions. But even amidst the unraveling, some levels of holy conferencing were still happening among smaller bodies. And where two or three are gathered, Christ is in our midst, and the Holy Spirit did its work. With the full general conference unable to meet in 2020 because of COVID, a number of churches decided to leave and form the Global Methodist Church, a new denomination that wanted to keep the restrictions on LGBTQ inclusion in place and who were upset that annual conferences like New England were not enforcing them. By the time there could finally be another worldwide gathering for general conference this year, the conference that has been taking place in Charlotte, North Carolina for the past two weeks, the balance had shifted. Across a series of votes that hunted down every restrictive position, provision in the discipline, from ordination to weddings to funding to the use of facilities, and finally, at the end of this past week, to the language in the social principles added in 1972, saying that homosexuality was incompatible with Christian teaching, every bit of that was removed by strong majorities. Almost all of them passed on the consent calendar without even any debate. United Methodists are now, at last, after 52 years, a fully inclusive church. As one of my colleagues described his video of what happened when the last of those provisions was removed, I didn't have a conga line of delegates singing Love Train on my general conference bingo card. <laughs> and there they were. While those votes got all the media headlines, that wasn't the only thing that happened at general conference. And people who are jubilant about the decision are not the only United Methodists that there are. During the first week, the alignment of national conference structures was changed in a plan called regionalization that will allow those in different regions of the world to adjust their practices in accordance with regional cultures. And for the first time, the United States will be its own region. It's always gone just from the jurisdictions to the world. There has never been a United States conference before. Uh, so because there's a lot of stuff, I'm not, I'm just going to read you the wrap up from a United Methodist news reporter named Joey Butler to give you a fuller flavor of the conference and the broader range of actions taken on many fronts. Then I will open up in case any of you have questions. So this was written on May 3rd, the last, after the last day of the conference, uh, by UMN United Methodist News reporter Joey Butler. On the final day of General Conference, eight years in the making, the Reverend Gary Graves, General Conference Secretary, referred to it as, quote, the multipurpose 2020 and 2420 20 meeting delegates sent set the budget that will fund the ministries of the denomination for the next four years, a budget significantly lower than the one it set in 2016. 
it could be argued that this was the most consequential general conference since the 1968 assembly that created the United Methodist Church. The church going forward from here is different than it was just a few weeks ago. Not all agree with the more inclusive stance the delegates took, but the passage of worldwide regionalization ensures all may continue ministry in their own context while remaining part of the connection. Church leaders are already looking at how members can remain united despite having different views, and delegates created a path for churches that have left the denomination to return in the future. The votes that changed the church's stance on sexuality may have garnered the most attention, but they were not the only actions taken in Charlotte. During the 10 days, delegates considered more than 1,000 petitions. Among other actions, they approved a new retirement plan for clergy granted deacons authority to offer Holy Communion and conduct baptisms in their ministry setting, celebrated church milestones, agreed to a full communion relationship with the Episcopal Church, which means that I could now preside at, an, at Epiphany at, at their communion and Nick Myers could preside here. We, we recognize that's what sort of full communion means. Our, our clergy are like their clergy. We are theologically of one mind. Um, and going back to his writing now, and approved the departure of four Eurasian annual conferences that plan to become the autonomous Christian Methodist Church. The final action was a 324 to 338 vote against reconsidering an earlier petition that would have added fossil fuels to the list of companies in which Westpath, our pension organization, is prohibited from investing. Drawing the assembly to a close with a centering moment after presiding over the final plenary session, Bishop Tracy S. Malone told everyone gathered, as you go forward from this general conference, tell the world about Jesus. As you go, tell them about his love. As you go, be love. Let's walk together, beloved, and let us never grow weary of doing the work of the kingdom. Then another subhead, GC delegates pass budget, reduce number of US bishops. Delegates on May 3rd approved a denominational budget with a bottom line that will vary by about 20 million, depending on giving collection rates over the next two years. By a vote of 647 to 31, a 95% majority, this year's delegates approved a 2025 to 2028 denominational budget of 373.4 million. That total is contingent on collection rates being at 90% or more for the next two years. If giving is below that percentage, the budget bottom line will be 353.6 million. Reflecting the effect of the loss of a quarter of U.S. churches to disaffiliation, the budget will be between 38% and 41% lower than the one set by the 2016 General Conference. Delegates also approved a plan for distributing 32 bishops across the United States, states which represents a reduction from the 39 active bishops currently serving. And my note here that every annual conference is served by one bishop. So we will be going somehow from 39 annual conferences to 32. Whether our lines are redrawn as a result of that remains to be seen. Next subheading, United Methodists remove same-sex wedding ban. United Methodist pastors no longer face potential penalties for being in a same-sex relationship or officiating at same-sex weddings, nor can, nor can they be compelled to officiate one. During the afternoon session of General Conference's final day, delegates approved four changes to church law that together end remaining bans related to homosexuality and protect the rights of pastors to choose which weddings to perform or not to perform. They also approved a change to the requirements that clergy practice celibacy in singleness 
an addition made in 1984 that targeted gay candidates for ministry, who of course could not marry legally in the United States at that time. Instead, the delegates supported adding after the requirement of integrity in all personal relationships, quote, social responsibility and faithful sexual intimacy expressed through fidelity, monogamy, commitment, mutual affection and respect, careful and honest communication, mutual consent, and growth in grace and the knowledge and love of God. Panelists look beyond general conference. The decision made at, the, at this general conference are a testimony to the United Methodist Church, said Bishop Tracy S. Malone, president of the Council of Bishops. We are a church where everyone can belong, she said. Malone was part of a panel discussing the future of a church where not every member approves of its new inclusive stance. Removing condemning language on homosexuality opens the church to be in a worldwide conversation, said Greater Northwest Area Bishop Cedric D. Bridgeforth, adding that he hopes that local churches, quote, will not grow weary in well-doing, close quote, because these decisions made at General Conference will call for a cultural shift and hard conversations. Next subheading. Get out of God's way, Bishop urges. During the final morning worship at General Conference, Council of Bishops President Tracy S. Malone said the work done at General Conference the past 10 days is not as important as what the church will do next. The resident bishop of the East Ohio Conference grounded her sermon in the words of Psalm 46, 1 through 3 and 10 and 11, she echoed David's bold proclamation that God is our refuge and strength. She asked delegates to imagine a United Methodist Church where hope is reborn and where people are reconciled to one another and committed to build God's beloved community. Let us imagine a church where no one, nobody, is marginalized, Malone said. Let us imagine a church that transcends geography and cultures and languages and borders and barriers and differences. I'm talking about a beautiful mosaic that reflects the kingdom, the kingdom of God. Church apologizes for sexual misconduct. General Conference issued a heartfelt apology to all who experienced sexual misconduct in the United Methodist Church. Submitted by the United Methodist Commission on the Status and Role of Women, the apology was part of a resolution passed in the last hour of General Conference on May 3rd. Not only was the apology statement read in its entirety during General Conference, but all United Methodist bishops around the world are to read the apology at their own upcoming annual conferences. I personally have been waiting for that apology over 30 years as one of those people. Votes of note. General Conference on April 30th approved via consent calendar a resolution asking that United Methodist institutions not buy government bonds from Israel, Turkey, and Morocco, given that those nations have engaged in long-term military occupations. The resolution comes amid pro-Palestinian protests on U.S. college campuses and after a demonstration at General Conference decrying Israel's military operations in Gaza. Westpath, the church's pension and investment agency, said it will carefully consider the non-binding measure. The majority of legislation supported by climate justice activists within the United Methodist Church was passed by General Conference on the consent calendar in the early part of its second week. Some of the petitions passed would direct churches to conduct annual audits of the carbon footprint of their buildings, grounds, or facilities, encourage annual conference sessions to reduce energy waste and consumption, and update or readopt existing church resolutions on creation care. And that's a wrap. It is a lot, even for those of us familiar with the system. 
since Crawford has been practicing full inclusion since we became a reconciling congregation under Eric Dupie's ministry years ago, the changes on that front don't affect us in practice. But knowing that the denomination to which we belong finally welcomes all, clears the air, helps everyone here feel fully and truly at home, and when I welcome new members now, I can not only say welcome to Crawford, but I can say welcome to Crawford as part of the United Methodist Church. Amen. The effect of the budgetary changes on local churches aren't going to be clear for a couple of years at least. Uh, as I mentioned, with the reduction in bishops, the lines of our conference and might change a little. We might share a bishop with another conference. Who knows how they're going to work that out. Um, bishop Johnson is only here as an interim, and we will be getting a new bishop this fall in any case. So that, that change will be coming, but not because of general conference. And does anybody have questions <laughs> about, <laughs> about that? Steve? All right. There we go. I'm gonna run around. I thought you might have a question. <laughs> Being new to all of this, does this now mean there is one more level of conferencing, the national conference, and where does that fit in? Oh, you are so smart. Um, yes, it does, sadly. <laughs> and it, it was, that was a matter of a lot of debate because the system of having the regional jurisdictions, I'm gonna come here so I don't, I don't have my back to people, but the, um, the regional jurisdictions that we have, there are like five of them, and that's where bishops are elected and all of that. The people bringing, at least most of the people bringing the regionalization plan, um, wanted as part of that to eliminate the jurisdictions. Both for that reason and because the jurisdictions were set up initially to make sure that black people in the South couldn't get transferred up into other jurisdictions. It was basically set up as part of an overall racist system back in the Civil War. And so with that, with that history, um, we've eliminated other vestiges of that, um, and delegates pushed hard to get rid of the jurisdictions for that reason, um, as well as to not create yet another layer, um, but that failed. So that's, but that, that was a key moment of debate, um, debate at the conference. So, you know, that, that may be the thing we argue about for the next 50 years. I don't, I, I don't know, but I, I expect it won't be the last, we, the last we hear about it. Just a comment. Uh, the end, uh, uh, the, the regionalization that was passed also ends the colonialism of the, United, the American United Methodist Church that set itself up as the big shot and everybody else was in a conference. Um, uh, and now we are all on an equal footing. Yes, that was, that was an important piece of it and one of the reasons, one of the arguments from conferences in Africa um, to adopting that regionalization plan. Given that the uh, conservative American churches have broken off to form the global Methodist church and also that other Eurasian group that's the, what do you call it, autonomous Methodist church, why do you think that Africa didn't say, okay, 
we're going to be the African Methodist Church because we don't want to still be connected to the ideas that are going to be part of the discipline. And do you foresee a further fracturing of what the United Methodist Church is today? Okay, a couple pieces of that. One is that while a lot of nations in Africa have very strong, you know, even outlaw homosexuality outright, there are other nations in Africa that are fine with that. But secondly, the regionalization plan allows for, and really the, the notion of having those nations be their own conference, we, we, the United States that has represented until now what it means to be United Methodist, have in our colonial way said, you can adapt the discipline to your own context. And that has remained in the regionalization plan. So in areas that, in conferences in nations in Africa or elsewhere around the world who don't agree with that inclusive stance, um, don't need to put that into practice. It's, it's sort of like the opposite of what we have been doing since 2016, when New England passed a resolution of nonconformity and said, we know the discipline says this, but we're not doing that. <laughs> we're, we're going to welcome everybody, we're going to ordain who we want to ordain anyway, and we're going to do same-sex weddings in our sanctuaries and basically defy the discipline. So that, the regionalization plan allows, allows for other regions to sort of do the flip side of that in their areas. I mean, hmm? and that was, that was an, well that, plus the fact that there, some, some of our global partners, it's, it's been an interesting ride because nations in Africa, in Asia, um, have been often very voted with the majority on issues of race and economics and have had basically a pretty liberal stand on every other issue but a very conservative stand on issues of sexuality. And so to break off, you know, we support Africa University in Zimbabwe and a lot of the African clergy are trained at Africa University. And so there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of history of Methodism, especially in, especially in Africa, um, also in Korea. Um, there's a lot of um, economic support that has come from the, from the denomination. And so each, what the regionalization does is allow for every, every region to adjust the discipline for their region within, within certain boundaries, but they, um, so that they can adjust for their context and still, still remain connected. The idea of, that they've been trying to work with for years is the fact that we can do so much more good together, especially on the, in mission and ministry, that to, to break it apart harms innocent people. You know, when we have an organization like UMCOR, the United Methodist Committee on Relief, you know, to, to break up into little pieces and to harm disaster relief for people around the globe um, wasn't what anybody really wanted to do. And we had tried a version of making the United States its own thing uh, maybe 20 years ago or so, and other delegates said, oh, no, 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 you only want to do that because you will change the discipline to allow gay people. So we will vote that down. You can't do that. And so they, they got over that hump 
with this broader regionalization plan. So um, we have to live into this. So it's, you know, we'll, we'll see how it goes. Um, I'm not sure that I know one of the Eurasian conferences that left was Russia. Um, I don't know what the other nations were, but I think in that, in that general area. So, um, that's where we are. All right, Pam and then Janet. Thank you. I know that um, that we're talking about structures and votes and layers and the administrative part of this, but what I've been thinking about is how grateful I am at the heart of it that has occurred here and to those people who led the effort for us to be explicit, Laura, Eric Dupy, others in, in the audience here. and the journey that we're all on, if we're all honest with each other, we're all on a journey to trying to learn how to be more inclusive in every way. And we, I think we all, if we're honest with ourselves, carry things in our hearts that we're still working on. But the continuing openness and conversation with each other helps us to get there. And I've seen that in action here the whole time I've been here at Crawford. I'm so grateful for that. And I know we still have a ways to go. There are probably a lot of things that we still need to work on to make sure that we truly are and, and appear to be welcoming and open to everyone and to bring Jesus' message to everyone in a way that's loving and non-judgmental. I know I work on that personally all the time, um, but I just wanted to express gratitude to those who led us here, yourself included, Colin, forever at conference and others and just remind us of beyond, I mean, the, the administrative structures are the result, and the changes in the discipline are the result, but first there has to be an opening of the heart, and I'm so grateful for that. I'm just curious, oh, why was it important enough to say that our communion is interchangeable? down the street at the Church of the Epiphany. Are we going to do more of that? When I was a little kid, we were the Methodist Episcopal Church. <laughs> so the full communion thing takes, takes a while. Um, we, we are already in full communion with the Lutherans, and that was, that was done a while ago. Um, and it's, it's trying to get at the truth we speak in the Apostles' Creed when we say, I believe in the Holy Catholic Church, that we should not be in competition, that we serve the same God, that we have a similar understanding. And it really, you know, this, this piece, because the, the Episcopal Church has been open and inclusive on homosexuality for longer. And so that, because they're only dealing with the United States. The Anglicans have another problem because they're, they're global like we are. Um, but the denominations that only dealt with the United States sort of worked this out a while ago. So I, while I don't know specifically that that vote at annual conference was the final thing that allowed full communion to happen, um, it does because it allows for the for the sharing of clergy, and it would be very difficult for a gay priest in the Episcopal Church to come to a United Methodist Church to preside, knowing the knowing that the denomination didn't feel like they were worthy somehow. And so this, it opens that door for more connection and the sort of work denomination by denomination, working out the, the differences. But certainly, you know, John Wesley was an Anglican priest. He was born an Anglican priest. He died an Anglican priest. 
he's started a reform movement within the Church of England to say, you know, when you come on Sunday, I see you do other stuff during the week, and really those things ought to match. You, you really ought to be living the life you profess that you want to live when you go on Sunday. And so he started this reform movement to actually to form lots of little small groups to actually talk with each other and hold each other accountable to living the life that they profess. Nobody likes to be reformed. They took away his pulpit. But he stayed an Anglican to the end. He only, the Methodist church was only born because the Wesley's movement jumped the pond to the United States. And, you know, in the 1700s, we didn't want to be the anything of England, let <laughs> alone the Church of England. And so after the preachers that he sent here went back to him and said, you know, we really need our own separate church. And Wesley didn't want to do that, but he said, oh, all right, and allowed for the Methodist Church in this country to take hold. So theologically, we are you know, on paper, we are very, very similar to the Episcopalians, which came from the Anglicans and the Anglican Church. Um, and the Anglican Church was only created so that Henry VIII could get divorced. <laughs> and so, the, and the Pope wouldn't let him, and so he formed his own church. So that, um, so the line from Catholics to Methodists on the theological front is really pretty straightforward. Um, but, other, oh. um, there is, there is uh, speaking of a little bit more process that needs to happen, uh, all of the good news that came out of the uh, General Conference has to be ratified by all of the um, individual annual conferences. And so, two-thirds of an annual conference voting for all of these measures uh, is required, and then two-thirds of the conferences have to pass it as well. But that's only the regional churches. Yeah, it's, I, I think you're right, yeah. So um, I'm, uh, I'll, I'd like uh, people to tell me how you'd like me to vote. <laughs> Yes. Colin and I are the delegates. Every church gets one clergy delegate and one lay delegate for every member of the clergy serving a church to the annual conference. Um, but on the, on the matter of the regionalization, because that's a structural issue, that is the thing that has to, it's kind of like when a, cha when a change to the Constitution is made, it has to be ratified by the states. This is the same, this is the same concept because the the core structure is being shifted around. So it, we don't have to have on a conference by conference level the discussions around full inclusion. That's, that part is done, but the structure of the regions is something that has to be ratified. And so to go back to full circle to Steve's question, it is possible that the regionalization plan um, hits a wall when it tries to get those two-thirds of two-thirds of the annual conferences um, to vote for it if people want to still try to eliminate the jurisdictions that way. Speaking of process and as a former Episcopalian, that needs to be approved by the Episcopal conference, which I believe we called convention, so anyway, but again, as a former Episcopalian, I don't see any problems getting in the way there. <laughs> yes, and I think the conversations around that have been going on for a very long time, so I, I anticipate that, that, that our voting to do that was the, um, was the last thing that was needed um, to make that happen. I just wanted to say that um, back when I was younger here and uh, as uh, growing up, that the Apostles' Creed was part of the service all the time, uh, each Sunday. 
and we questioned the Holy Catholic Church, and we were we um, were told and taught that the Catholic is spelled with a small c, meaning worldwide, and not um, not the Roman Catholic Church. So that was. Yes, and there in the hymnal to this day is a little asterisk next to the word Catholic to say this means universal. And as a Baptist girl growing up, when we, it, you know, if I went somewhere instead that, I stood with my mouth shut. <laughs> no, I was not going to say it because, the, you know, there are enough people who thought it meant the Roman Catholic Church that the hymnal still has to have an asterisk in it to explain it, so yes. Thank you. All right, and speaking of full communion, uh, we'll go to our prayer time and then have celebrate communion here, celebrate communion there. Should we sing a song? We should. <laughs> an anthem. The choir has a great anthem, so we will listen to that, and then we will pray. Holy conferencing accomplishes these things.
All right, and I'm going to ask you to pass the piece while you're seated to the person closest to you. So we save a little bit of, of time in doing that, but if you, if you have a prayer concern card, hold it up and Laura will come and get it from you. All right, and while Laura is bringing those, we turn to birthdays, and Aiden, who is up in the balcony, Aiden Gutierrez on the 10th turns two. <laughs> and Barb Siftar's mother, and my mother went into labor on Mother's Day in the same year, but I was the first and Barb was the fourth, and so Barb's mother was quick. <laughs> but I made my mother work harder. So Barb was born first on May 10th, and I followed in the wee hours of May 11th on the same day, the same year, um, my, my twin. So other, let's see, do we have any of is this birthdays? Other birthdays, Steve. Randy, awesome. Birthday on Wednesday, Colin. May the fourth be with you. Yes, yes. May the fourth be with Colin's granddaughter and Linda's. Fifteen. Oh my goodness. Yes, Janet. Oh, Audrey Herman also on the eleventh. Laura, welcome back. <laughs> Jeffrey's birthday is the fourteenth. Oh, mother's laboring on Mother's Day. Yes, Linda. Linda's granddaughter is Tuesday the 7th. All right, happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Amen. Other celebrations? Anything from the live stream? Okay, on concerns, um, Bernadette, Jessica, and others who are sick, stuff is still going around and seems to be heading straight for people's throats. I don't know. Um, and here, so this is, oh, okay, this is a friend of Sue and Steve Powers named Sal, who's going into surgery tomorrow for pancreatic cancer. And certainly all those living with the ravages of war, those, those having to explain general conference to their own congregations in all kinds of various settings, some of whom will be happy, some of whom will be furious, and um, some of whom will be mixed. So, um, and every leader, I think, in every nation trying to work for peace with justice, um, our climate, our planet, many things in this world. I will ask us to take a moment in silent prayer, and then I will close with a prayer from connectus.org. Let us pray. O 
O God, in your church is diversity, as your word declares that just as the body, though one, has many parts to form one body, so it is with Christ. We were all baptized with one spirit to form one body. Thank you for including everyone so that we may all contribute to being a reflection of you. We pray that we may all appreciate the diversity among our church siblings and embracing our differences, even as we affirm our unity in the body of Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Our hymn is number 620, and I in one bread, one body. The words are in your bulletin. I invite you to rise in body or in spirit as we sing. turn 
either to your hymnal to the liturgy or to page 13 if you want to follow along with the whole thing in your hymnal. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, 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 holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, Jesus took bread, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink of this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we might be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The bread which we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. And the cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. Will those who are serving please come.
Great. A few announcements. The Michoam Choral Society's Spring Concert is here today, this afternoon at three o'clock. Uh, ticket information's in the bulletin. You can talk to to Peter. Um, always a, a wonderful, wonderful spring concert with them. Uh, over the winter, we collected blankets and pillows for the refugees homed at Logan Airport. We had that collection in April. Um, they're still coming in there as a transfer point to go out to other places. They are taken to local shelters and churches to shower and things during the daytime. Um, they need toiletries to do that, so we've been collecting toiletries to make care packs for them. We delivered 200 of them during the month of April, and they're still there, so we're still collecting. So you can continue to bring those in in the marked bin outside of the parlor. Um, the Coalition of Organizations Supporting the Haitian Families in Woburn is setting up English classes at the hotels where the families are staying, and they're looking for volunteers to run them. Do you speak English? Do you want to help? Those are the requirements. There are training sessions at the Church of the Epiphany, where we are now in full communion, um, on May 8th, May 14th, and May 22nd in the evening. Uh, contact Neil Cudmore, wave, uh, if you want more information on becoming, becoming part of that. Um, and a combination celebration and announcement. Um, there's a cookbook, an extended family cookbook, which will be distributed next Sunday, May 12th, and is yours for the taking. It is a collection of recipes gathered and used by the Hobson family over several decades. Been a labor of love for, for Peter for quite some time. Uh, the book will be available free of charge in the hope that you might enjoy some of its content enough to contribute to the church's effort in feeding neighbors in need in our, in Winchester and surrounding communities. Um, please plan to take, so they're going to be here next week. So this is a pre-announcement. But when they get here, please plan to take only one per immediate family. They make a great Mother's Day gift. So we'll have, we'll have them here next week, and congratulations to, to Peter on a lifetime of work. There's over 200 recipes in this thing. <laughs> it's a, a great gift for, for Crawford and to help feed those in need, even as we feed ourselves. Uh, we will be celebrating our graduates in worship on June 9th. If you have a loved one that's graduating this spring or has graduated at any point from any level back since we celebrated graduates last June, um, get that information to Stacy and a picture um, so that we can, we can have all of that and properly celebrate them on the 9th. We are grateful for your financial support you can give by leaving cash or check in one of the plates on the tables at the front or the back. You can also donate at crawfordmethodist.org slash give or by texting crawfordumc to 44321. And now go in peace. Go as one. Go knowing that every one of you is a beloved, holy, child of God and welcome in the United Methodist Church. Amen. Let us listen to the postlude and then go to our full communion in Gifford Hall. Oh yes, there is a bit of holy conferencing. We, oh, that's going to be the postlude. Okay. So let's all just sing that.